The Halls of Fame is brought to you by Halls. Get Halls and get going. And by Rolaids. R-O-L-A-I-D-S spells relief. They call her the Black Widow because of the way she devours her opponents. Hello again, everybody. I'm Fran Healy, and welcome to the Halls of Fame. On today's show, we'll enter the web of one of the most recognizable stars in billiards, Jeanette Lee. Tell us about your childhood. Well, I was born in Brooklyn, and um, I have a, an older sister who's a year and a half, two years older than I am. And I lived with my mother and father, and uh, I think that I was, I was a very happy-go-lucky child who probably needed a lot more attention than I got. And what I mean by that is that my mother and father worked a lot. Um, my sister had her own friends and I was by, my, by myself so although I was very affectionate I think that I gradually became somebody that kind of withdrew into myself. What do you mean? I, I don't have a whole lot of good memories about my childhood. I see it as being very lonely. I, I remember being a very happy child um, as in you know I was more the person that would just run up and give anybody a hug you know but I do remember being alone a lot. And I remember never fitting in. I remember being in a, I mean, it was, you know, it was Crown Heights, Brooklyn. You know, there wasn't another Asian in sight anywhere around. I was made fun of every day for being a chink and, and stuff like that, going to school. And um, I had a genius older sister and I had parents who worked all the time. So I think that in my heart, I was a very, uh, affectionate kind of loving kind of person but it was it was hard to develop that side of me and probably I don't think that it, that really ever did come back out again until after I I found pool and, and that helped me find out who I was what was school like in terms of schools I went to PS 91 in Brooklyn it was an all-black neighborhood uh, didn't have a lot of close friends here and there I became friendly with one or two people but I just remember that walk to school being really brutal, Why? you know, because it was uh, an almost completely black neighborhood, and and I was Korean. Well, according to them, I was Chinese. I was Chink. It was the same thing, and every day I was just dealing with that. You know, I was dealing with being a girl. You know, being a, um, you know, just alone. You know, not having a lot of support. I mean, I didn't have anyone to stand up for me or anything. So I just remember that, and then I remember being in junior high school where it just got meaner. And, you know, I was still this, like, squiggly little scrawny nothing, while the other women, you know, they were, like, bada-bing, bada-boom at the age of nine, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was, like, this little nothing. I was concave, for goodness sake, you know? And so it was, it was very hard socially for me. And then I, uh, my, my mom got fed up because I was getting beat up. I was, you know, I was in fights. And so, for those reasons. And so my mother eventually decided to put me in a private school in a place called Greenwich Village, which she thought was just a really nice little area in Manhattan. So I start commuting from Brooklyn to Greenwich Village. She said it was the worst mistake of her life. You know, that's where, you know, I, I, I learned to smoke my first cigarette and my, um, you know, all my friends, they were having earrings and mohawks, and, you know, my mother's like, oh, my God, what happened to my daughter? And it was the first time that I really understood that, you know, if I cut class, the world would not explode. What are my parents going to do if I cut class? I, I, I was starting to learn that I had the power. Whereas in our culture, <laughs> till you're 90, you have no power when it comes to your parents, you know. But I was learning differently, you know, and, and I have to agree, it probably wasn't a good idea at the time. I went to the school, and then I went to Bronx Science High School, where, uh, okay, so I went from an all-black school to an all-white school to now Bronx Science, which was like half Asian, not like maybe 40 Asian, 40 white, and 20% everything else, you know. And so this was big difference, because I've never been around so many Asians in my life. I was like, whoa, you know. And so for the first time, that was not an issue. 
my race was not an issue. But then you had all the other dealings of teenage life and whether, you, you know, your body starts to develop, things start to happen, you start liking guys and all these things were happening and all the meanwhile arguing with my mom constantly. And then by the time I was 18, I was away from home. Um, and again, my, my, my mom loves me, you know, and that was never a question. And I think that that held me on through a lot of things because I knew that it wasn't that she didn't love me. It was that we didn't understand each other. I didn't understand her. She didn't understand me. You know, I don't remember her ever playing one game with me of any kind, ever. You know, I just remember homework. I remember that I had to practice piano when I could know that all the kids were playing outside. You know, I was just, and it was for love that she wanted the best for me and she, you know, and, and that she did love me, but I just didn't agree with it. You know, I was, I was angry. What about sports? There was no sports at that time. At that, by the time I was, um, okay, by the time I was 12, I had some kind of a tumor in my neck when I was four. They found a cyst in my leg when I was 11. I had two surgeries. My third surgery was scoliosis. They planted two Harrington 12-inch rods in my back um, from the top of my neck to my pelvic bone at the age of 12. So I went through junior high school wearing a brace, like up here, strapped on, and I actually had to try to look human with that. At that point, I had very, very short hair, and that was the beginning of me growing my hair to my trademark of, of you know, the black widow with the long black hair. It was to cover my scar. That's why I had long hair. And um, it, it destroyed me emotionally. I, I felt like a monster. And uh, I never, ever felt like I ever fit in anywhere. And let me see, I've had five surgeries in the last year and a half. I had, um, well, the easiest one was uh, with laser one, I had LASIK eye surgery, which was great. But they also, I had bursitis and bicep tendonitis, so I had shoulder surgery. I had a herniated disc in my neck, I had neck surgery. I had uh, back surgery to correct pseudoarthrosis, which had developed from my first spinal fusion at the age of 13, just to find out that my back was rejecting the new hardware and had to go in for another back surgery this year. So other than that, how do you feel? Other than that, things are very cool. <laughs> now, how does a young lady go, young woman, go from playing the piano Mother wants you to play the piano. I hated the piano. To billiards. Pool. Right. Mm -hmm. How's that? I was, I was living on my own at around the age of 18, working, and I had heard from a couple of people in the pool room that, um, I'm sorry, I heard from a couple of people at work that there was a new pool room opened up. Now, it hadn't been too long since The Color of Money had come out. Are you familiar with that, Tom sure, Cruise, Paul sure. Newman? So I guess there was like this big rush about pool being all cool and everything like that. And there were a lot of new rooms, not those old dingy divey bars, but just nice plush cappuccino cafe, you know, billiard clubs instead of pool hall that were opening up. And there was one called Chelsea Billiards on 21st Street between 5th and 6th. And it was maybe four or five blocks away from my work, so I went there. I was just curious, and I remember walking in, and there was all these people and noise and music, and I just remember walking towards the back, and there was this older man playing by himself, and he was just beautiful. I mean, he was just like the the greatest artist of all time, or or um, a dance. You know, I mean, it was like his feet weren't touching the ground. It was just beautiful. And I was watching him, and he was so graceful around the table. And for some reason, I couldn't hear the people anymore, and I couldn't hear the, the music, and I couldn't hear anything but the click of the balls on his table. And I could almost, I, I felt like I could almost hear him breathing. You know, I could sense his, his pace. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't think about a career. I didn't think about money. I didn't think about a tour, competitive. I just knew that. Is it the first time you played pool? The first time I ever saw a pool table was when I was 15, ever. I was supposed to be in class. I bet mom was real happy about that move to the billiard room. Yeah. 
No, I mean, if we didn't get along before, then we really didn't go, get along then. And, you know, I, I really feel badly towards my mother at this point because I, I think about if I had a young girl that decided she just wanted to play video games for the rest of her life, you know, at 18 and was out playing anything, golf, whatever it is, till 5 o'clock in the morning, I'd be having a hissy fit, you know what I mean? It, it's just, how do you bank on that? You know, how do you know that your daughter is going to put in the kind of time that I did? You don't. She's, she wasn't with me. She didn't see how hard I worked. She just knew I was out till 5, 7 o'clock in the morning. Some time I didn't, you know, I didn't see her for a few weeks. And the only way that her or any of my friends, anyone after that day saw me, anyone that you were to contact in my life, the only way they could see me is to come to that forum because I didn't leave. So now you take up the sport at 18 seriously. How long did it take you to dominate? Okay, started at 18. I turned professional at 21, and I was number one in the world at 23, a year and a half later. And uh, I don't know if I ever feel like I was at the point of dominating, because I, I think I still have that feeling that I can get so much better. It gets so much better than this. It does. You just, I need to stop having surgeries, <laughs> you know? And, and that's okay because that is what, I believe that there's a reason why I've had these surgeries. And the reason why I've had scoliosis is so, is so that I can now be the, the, the national spokesperson for the Scoliosis Association. So that there's a lot of kids out there that can look up to someone and go, she'll understand me. And when I say something, and I've had scoliosis, and I've raised myself to this level, it can inspire someone rather than just being someone that can pity me. I don't want people to pity me for what I've been through. I want people to respect me for what I've been through. And that is your choice. I don't have a choice about the fact that I've had all these problems. But I certainly have a choice as to how um, I deal with it and how I let it affect others. And I truly believe that everything happens for a reason, but sometimes you have to make up that reason, you know? What's your mom think of it now? Oh, my mom loves it now. She thinks that I'm the coolest thing on earth. And, I, you know, I've grown up. I've been able to see that her legitimate concerns. Of course, a kid will never agree with all the things their mom and dad does. And, and I'm not always going to agree with all the things, but I respect her and I love her and I appreciate her holding on through all that time that I was really re rebelling and being so, um, so hard. I think very, very hard to deal with. We're talking here in New York and in, in the uh, uh, Women's Sports Foundation has their annual dinner. Mm -hmm. Do you talk to the other women? I mean, there are a lot of uh, sports represented here at the, um, at the yeah. dinner. Yeah. yeah, so do you talk to other women about their chosen profession, their sport, and, and talk about getting more females involved? I can't tell you how much the Women's Sports Foundation has done for me. I mean, I can tell you that of every single day in the year, I find this to be by far one of the most important days that I can be part of anything. And the reason why I say this is that the way that they have handled me personally, number one, they gave me as much respect as I've ever seen them give anyone, ever. I've seen them take people that the rest of the world consider major stars because they're on t TV or they're in a major sport and treat me as just as important as anyone else. I mean, extra, extra special if I had a question. I mean, just their attention to detail. But also, they're, they've been my mentor, been my role model in terms of without making me, I, somehow, I don't know how, I, they, they did it exactly. But they made me, number one, feel very special. Number two, they gave me everything they can give. They offered me everything that they can offer. And yet without making me feel bad, they made it aware to me that I had something to offer. I, and so I'm, I'm realizing at the beginning, 
that number one, okay, I'm a hot shot in my own sport. I come here and I feel like a peon compared to all these incredible women who have gone through so much compared to me. I mean, just their stories. I mean, it just makes you just sit there and want to cry what these women have gone through in their sports and 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 how they've become leaders in their sport and, and made differences, you know. And I sit here and I just think, but yeah, but what can I do, you know? Okay, that's great for them. But they they somehow made me believe in myself. You know what I mean? That it's not just about me going to my tournaments, taking my prize money, going home and doing my exhibitions. But let's take a real good look at this. And do you love this sport? And if you do, what have you done? How do you like your nickname? I think it's bad. I like it. <laughs> I like the nickname, the Black Widow. I didn't like it at first. How'd you get it? I was at a pool room, billiard club. I was at a billiard club. Um, I was at a room called Howard Beach Billiard Club in Howard Beach. I had heard that there was this million dollar place opening up. And uh, I walked in there one day and I, I'd met the owner. In any case, started playing there all the time. They treated me like gold. And after about a year, we were talking and reminiscing about the good times we'd had. He's sitting there with his espresso and his little pinch of lime. And, we have the bouncer standing there, you know. This is the hired beach, you know. And so he said, you know, he's got a cigar in his mouth. He said, you know, I remember the first time I ever saw you. And I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, you're this cute little thing. You walk into my room and you're dressed in all black with your long black hair. And he said that I, uh, I went over to the table and I felt the cloth. And that's when I, I knew right away that this is something really happened, because that's what I do when I, whenever I go to a room for the first time, I walk over and I feel the cloth. And it, it, it gives me a sense of the room, whether it's on tight, if it's put together well, if it's new cloth, if it's dirty cloth, if it's kept up, it just tells me a lot. And, um, and he said, then you went, you know, I was kind of curious about you, you know, the guys were looking at Jen. He said, and then you, you walk over and you got a set of balls and you started whacking all the balls and your face looked as evil as can be. And he goes, you know what you looked like? And I said, what? He goes, you look just like a black widow. What is the most difficult thing about your sport? If you consider the fact that Shaquille O'Neal, Michael Jordan, all the best basketball players in the world, they can have 20 guys on them with a second and a half to go, and they can make a three-point jumper like that. But give them a free throw, right? Same shot every time. Nobody's on you. You have plenty of time. Dribble, you can take your time, and you look at that. Why the best basketball players in the world don't make it every time? Every time. Why? It's the same shot. It's not that far. You make three-pointers from back there. You got any guys on you. And it's because... You, when you isolate somebody to stand right there and you just look, it's all here. And that's what we do every shot. You have all the time in the world, all the time to screw up, all the time to doubt yourself and wonder and, and question your arm and question your, your plan and everything. And I think in pool, it, it's, just, it's, it's very similar to golf in that way. It's very, very hard on the mind. It's very, very hard um, to trust yourself and to look at the target and just and just know you know you can shoot, you know you you know what you're supposed to do, but to control it exactly the right moment, exactly the way you want, and get the cue ball to come three rails and land on a dime, you know, that's that's here. You mentioned before the color of money. Great movie. Also, there was a movie, The Hustler, with Jackie Gleason, Paul Newman. That's my favorite movie of all time. Great movie. Yeah. Have you ever hustled anybody in the billiard room? I would never. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 we, you know. So you have. Is that a good answer? <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Do you ever think back? I mean, you've enjoyed a lot of success now and a pioneer in, in women's billiards. You ever think back to when you were growing up, those miserable times you had walking to school, and think, look at me now? Yeah. There's a lot of times I think back about 
the people that were mean to me, you know, and the things that happened to me. Um, just what I've been through, and I'm very proud of myself. I'm very proud of, you know, I really found that the difference between a champion and everyone else, I always used to think that what made a champion was superior skill. I always thought that it was somebody that was born with a gift that no one else had. You know, it was just given to them. Um, or they were all insane. And, you know, the more champions you meet, the more you find out that they're real people. They're all real people, and they all, all had their own problems. And the only thing that I've found that is in common with every single one of them that isn't in the rest is that they never gave up. Being diagnosed with scoliosis has inspired Jeanette Lee to serve as a national spokesperson for the cause. For the Halls of Fame, I'm Fran Healy. So long, everybody. The Halls of Fame has been brought to you by Zantac 75. For tough heartburn, doctors know. And by High Five Biscuits, freshly baked dog treats.